Hey, good afternoon to you. 406 now. News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up this hour, Julie Kelly will be with us. She's going to talk to us about the ongoing threats to your liberty and the effort to trample Donald Trump's rights. Julie, so good at covering all of that. And Kerry Severino is here at 5 o'clock. A big case being argued before the Supreme Court today over just how far the federal government can stretch its power without any authorization from Congress. That's a big deal, too. And you can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Okay, so there's a, a saga that's been playing out. I've given you some updates on about three illegal immigrants, attempted illegal immigrants, who drowned trying to cross into the United States recently. And the Biden administration blamed the state of Texas because, remember, in Eagle Pass, Texas, the Abbott administration, Governor Greg Abbott and company, they've established two and a half miles of a park there where Texas has taken over and said, we are securing the border anywhere we can. And it turns out this two and a half miles, this park, is where we can do it. So we're going to. So they sent in the Texas National Guard. They have been blockading the border. They have riot shields up, concertina wire, whatever they can to stop people from getting in, and they've had success. The Border Patrol agents on the ground adore this. They're so grateful that someone is finally working to secure the border and to relieve them of even two and a half miles of the chaos that they're experiencing. Now, the leadership of the Border Patrol at the direction of DHS, is forcing the Border Patrol to get off of its mission of securing the border and instead to process more and more illegals into the country. And as a part of that mission, the Biden administration decided to blame Texas for a couple of drownings in the Rio Grande. An awful outcome for anybody's life. Now, this is not the first time people have drowned trying to cross into our country. No, that has happened hundreds of times during the Biden administration. There is never news coverage of it. There's never any wailing from the White House about it because the last thing they want to do is draw attention to the fact that in addition to all of the death and suffering they've bringing to the United States now by way of the cartels and the drugs, there's also a lot of death going on on the border from human beings who are are collapsing, trying to make the journey into the United States at the invitation of the Biden administration. It is awful what is happening. So, of course, it's rich now that they're blaming Texas for a problem that they caused. Those people wouldn't be dead were it not for the Biden administration. It's not Greg Abbott's fault. It's Biden's fault. And so here's here's what you've got. Drew Holden, who is a writer for the Washington Free Beacon, has a good summary of the way the Biden administration and the media have handled it this week. He writes, last night, puts this thread together, and he writes, CBS News rushed out a scoop that Texas officials had physically blocked Customs and Border Protection from rescuing drowning migrants. It wasn't true. While CBS has since corrected the story, it kicked off a mini news cycle ready made to smear Republicans. Drew says, as Fox News' Bill Malusian points out, this narrative originated with the Biden administration. Biden's own DOJ has actually since disputed their own administration's initial claims. And that's right. So the White House said this. Here's the White House claim over the over the weekend, quote, on Friday night, a woman and two children drowned near Eagle Pass. And Texas officials blocked U.S. Border Patrol from attempting to provide emergency assistance, end quote. That is the White House's claim over the weekend. Now, the Justice Department has since, in a court filing, declared that the migrants had already drowned by 8 p.m. Border Patrol did not even make contact with Texas until an hour later at 9 p.m., in meaning They had been dead for well over an hour by this point, by the time the Border Patrol gets in touch with Texas and says, hey, this happened on the border. So this was a lie. And as Bill Malusian points out, it's very much like the false horse whipping story. Remember that? When it was claimed that the Border Patrol, the Biden administration claimed that the Border Patrol was whipping Haitian illegal immigrants who were trying to enter the country. Look at them. They're on a horse whipping. And it was still images being shared. The photographer who was a, a photographer, I believe for Reuters, he came out and said, it's not true. It is not true. They, they were not whipping anybody. I watched. I was there. I took the photos. There were no whip. There was no whipping. Alejandro Mayorkas was alerted about this, what the photographer had seen firsthand. 
And even after he received that email indicating that there was no whipping going on, he went out and he defamed the men and the women of the Border Patrol and said that they had been whipping illegals and made it out to be some sort of racial crisis. It was despicable, detestable, and one of many reasons Mayorkas should not be in that job. So here the lies go again. And so the Justice Department begrudgingly admits in a court filing that no, we didn't even tell Texas about the drownings until well after they had occurred. So Drew Holden over the Free Beacon points out that tons of outlets repeated the lie. Many haven't even corrected their own reporting, even though CBS doesn't stand by its initial claims. They've since edited the piece in the headline. They added an editor's note that's far different. The editor's note pointing out that the Justice Department uh, had changed its tune. The same can't be said about the Washington Post, who at, at least as of early this afternoon, that was yesterday afternoon, were content to leave up their initial story and tweet parroting a Democrat congressman repeating the same dishonest assertion about Texas. Here's the Washington Post tweet that he cites. After a migrant woman and two children drowned in the Rio Grande, a U.S. congressman said Texas bears responsibility for blocking border agents. Washington Post peace from January 14th. Three migrants drown after Texas blocks feds from part of Rio Grande, DHS says. So the Washington Post just being stenographers for the Biden administration and advancing a lie. Axios. Homeland Security is calling Texas's immigration policies cruel and inhumane after three migrants drowned while trying to cross the U.S. southern border after Texas military officials prevented Border Patrol agents from helping them on Friday. The lie is even more explicit. The Associated Press writing, U.S. says Texas blocked border agents from entering park to try to save three migrants who drowned. And the list goes on and on and on. NBC News, a woman and two children drowned in the Rio Grande on Friday night in Eagle Pass, Texas, after U.S. border agents were prevented from responding, federal officials said Saturday. NPR, White House blames Texas in deadly migrant drowning. So by now you, you understand the point. This never occurred. This is a lie. Texas is not responsible. And this came up in the briefing today. Coringe was asked about this. The questioner here, I believe, is it Jackie Heinrich? I believe is Jackie at Fox, asking this question. She has Corinne's dead to rights, uh, obviously, and lays out the details and says, you know, essentially, are you going to stick with that or are you going to give us an update here? And you should, I mean, the, the sanctimony that comes out of the mouth of this deeply moronic press secretary, listen to her. Um, if you're saying that, you know, the, the White House, the president doesn't want to, you know, insult the American people, Will the administration then amend its separate statement um, that imply that Texas officials were responsible for the deaths of three migrants um, when, in fact, they had nothing to do with it? They had already been dead for an hour by the time Mexico told uh, anyone in the U.S. about it. And the administration admitted as much in their court filing. They, they acknowledged that in their court filing, but the statement from the White House implies that Texas was responsible and a number of outlets were forced to issue corrections and editor's notes because of that White House statement. So will the White House amend that statement? So let's be sensitive here. Three people died. Three oh my gosh. Are you serious? That's where we're going to start? You're not being sensitive enough in your question. Let me, let me start with the sensitive point. Jackie Heinrich, three people died. Don't you realize that? Well, yeah, I'm asking why you lied about it. Corrections and editor's notes because of that White House statement. So will the White House amend that statement? So let's be sensitive here. Three people died. Three migrants died. Two children and a woman. That was devastating. Devastating situation, heartbreaking situation. So let's be really mindful of what we're talking about here. I want to take a step back and, uh, and, um, and just as you're talking about our statement, uh, look, as I, as I mentioned, a woman and two children died. Oh, my gosh. They drowned. Her brain is breaking before our very eyes. Near Eagle Pass, which is, as I said, devastating. Uh -huh. And that Texas officials blocked Border Patrol from access, accessing the area. That's what was happening at that time. That's it. That's the whole thing. So um, if you're saying that. Sorry, just replaying it for you. So here you have, you know, she's like, ah, I just I just want you to know three people died. Yeah. OK, what are you talking about? You lied about the state of Texas. 
And the Biden administration is angry that the border is being secured. Let's remember what's happening here. The whole reason they're, they're outraged is that someone dare secure the border. Because if it were up to Biden, what would they be doing? They'd be cutting open the concertina wire. They'd be encouraging more children to swim across the Rio Grande and to meet their unfortunate ends, their awful ends inside of the waters. That's what the Biden administration wants. That's awful. It's fair as that it is Texas's fault. Texas, by the way, has had to slow down its buses of illegal immigrants to uh, sanctuary cities because of the snow. Apparently, the snow has caused some trouble uh, right now. So there's been a pause on some of those buses flowing. But uh, Greg Abbott has been saying, look, if you're going to make this my problem, I'm going to make this your problem. You take them. What are you, what are you putting them in Texas for? And so he's, send, he's been sending them north at taxpayer expense. Been sending them north to places like New York and Washington, D.C. and Chicago. These are sanctuary cities. The mayors of these respective cities continue to complain about it. Oh, there's so many people. Okay, so what, what's the complaint? We don't have the money to be able to take care of them. We're running a budget shortfall. That's the complaint? Really? What about let's secure the border? Why am I not hearing that out of any of these mayors? They're not talking about securing the border. They're not talking about deporting people. They're just talking about the budget shortfall. We need more money. And of course, that's true. A lot of their rich people are fleeing their areas. They've decided that big, the big taxpayers have, are, are getting out of places like New York. But this is, all a, a, this is all a stunt to get more money out of us, out of the federal taxpayer. Chicago wants you, no matter where you live within the sound of my voice, to give them more money. That's what they want. We want more cash. Because if they cared about stopping all of this, if they wanted to stop all the people pouring into the country, if they wanted the border to be secured, if they wanted to, if they felt actually overwhelmed by illegal immigration, what would they do? What would they do? They would contact ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and say, I've got illegals in custody right now. Please come collect them and take them out of the country. But they don't do that. That's why they're sanctuary cities, by definition. When an illegal immigrant commits a crime in the United States and goes into custody, and if the feds find out about it, when the, fe when the feds are notified, they send along a detainer request and say, hold on to that guy. Don't release him. In fact, when you do release him, we want to arrange for you to release him into our custody so we can take over from here. This person should not be in the United States of America. That's how lo the local and the federal law enforcement cooperation is supposed to go. That is not what's happening in these sanctuary cities. They are forbidding the local law enforcement from getting in touch with the feds, you are not allowed to tell them you have this person in custody. You will not cooperate with them. If they find out that that person's in custody and they show up to the jail to take them into custody, you release them out of a back door, out of sight of the feds. That's the way these governments are working, these, these Democrat-run cities. They're sanctuary cities. They're refusing these detainers. They're refusing to work with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Imagine being an ICE officer right now in the Biden administration. You're getting it from both directions. You, you're getting no support from the Democrats who run these local cities. And the Biden administration is basically telling you your job is worthless. You're not involved in anything of meaning here. You're not to enforce the nation's laws. You are not to deport people. You're not to get rid of people who are here, who shouldn't be, who are here illegally, whose very first act upon arriving in the country was to break our law. So the mayors are unserious. They're like, it's a scam. They don't actually, they're not trying to secure the border. You never hear them say that. They're, all they want is money. Everything with these Democrats, it's always about trying to exploit a crisis to their benefit at the expense of taxpayers. That is it. It's every single time. It's the Rahm Emanuel school of thought. Never let a crisis go to waste. This crisis for people like Mayor Eric Adams in New York and Brandon Johnson in Chicago, they see this as a ripe opportunity to rob you of more. And if they were sincere, they would work to get these people out of the country. That's not what they're doing. It's 421. All right, let's go to the phones. I've got Steve calling in from Ashburn. Steve, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show, sir. Steve, my man. Hello, Vince. Hello there, Steve. What's going? What's Vince. on your mind, sir? Hello, hello. Uh, excellent show, excellent program. Thank you. Lots of, lots of topics, although I will restrict to what I had told Corey um, and kind of goes along with what you had said earlier. I, I've listened to a lot of things that Klaus Schwab has said. He sounds 
eerily like Kurt Frobe as Arc Goldfinger when he has uh, James Bond on that uh, platform and he's going to cut him in half with a laser. And he says, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Uh, that's distinctly how I hear uh, um, Klaus Schwab. The, this globalist agenda is about wanting us to die. It's the D.I.E. <laughs> it's the D.I.E. Let me see if I can't. Uh, now, that you, since you're bringing this up, I'm going to see if I can't. Uh, jam out a quick comparison. This is, just so people hear, this is Klaus Schwab introducing, probably against his will, Javier Mille today. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's for me a great, great honor to welcome Javier Mille. As you know, he's a freely elected president of uh, Argentina, and it's actually your first trip to a foreign country after you have been elected. Okay, so that's uh, that's Klaus Schwab. Now, this is Goldfinger. Let's see what that sounds like. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. <laughs> there is nothing close. you can talk to me about that I don't already know. That's pretty close. I like that comparison. It's the German accent. I mean, perhaps we're being a little unfair, but not that unfair. It's pretty close. <laughs> It, it, it is it is it is it is pretty close. Uh, they're both uh, megalomaniacs. Yeah, I dig that. Thanks, Steve. That's a useful comparison. <laughs> both evil villains. Only one of them's fictional. Hey, coming up on the program, Julie Kelly will be with us. We're going to talk to her about the effort to trample the Constitution, President Trump's rights, and of course yours. The left is on the march. Julie Kelly calls it out next. All right, it is 435 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. Coming up on the show, we're going to be joined by Carrie Severino at 5 o'clock. She'll talk to us about an ongoing Supreme Court case today with big implications for liberty in the United States and whether or not the federal government's allowed to do things Congress doesn't authorize them to do. Uh, I'm, I'm praying for liberty here. Uh, you can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Now, by now you know with uh, crystal clarity that the Biden administration and all of the associated Democrats it works with across the country are abusing their powers in the government in order to try and destroy Biden's top political opponent, Donald Trump, and of course, by extension, the will of the people who would vote for him in the first place. And yesterday, there was a bit of a breath of fresh air, a small one, as four federal judges on a D.C. appellate court just issued, I think, a, a really big statement and a smackdown on the effort to trample Donald Trump's rights. For more on this, I want to bring in Julie Kelly, who follows all of it very closely. She's the author of the Declassified by Julie uh, Kelly Substack and the author of of January 6th, how Democrats used the Capitol protest to launch a war on terror against the political right. Julie, good to have you back with us. Thank you. Hey, Vince. Thanks for having me on, as give, always. Of course. If you could, just give us a breakdown of what happened yesterday in this appeals court. So this was pretty stunning. And in fact, legal observers said it was highly unusual for these four Republican judges on the appellate court for the District of Columbia to write this 12-page statement related to the handling, uh, really secret and unlawful handling of obtaining Donald Trump's uh, Twitter data. And it's sort of complicated since I just posted an article on my Substack Declassified with Julie Kelly to kind of walk through what happened. But what these four judges said, and it was authored by Naomi Rao, who is a Trump appointee on the circuit court in Washington, said that this was unprecedented that they, this was an end around of executive privilege protections, that the judge in the case on the district court, Beryl Howell, who was the chief judge, and the three Democrat judges on the appellate panel who upheld what Judge Howell did, that they should have presumed that these communications were privileged, and they should have given Donald Trump the opportunity to assert executive privilege. Instead, what slimy, dirty Jack Smith did is seek not just a search warrant on the Twitter files, on Donald Trump's Twitter files, but asked and received a non-disclosure order to prevent Twitter from telling Donald Trump about the search warrant for six months. 
can what rationale be preventing him? What I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did not mean to interrupt you, but ra what rationale could you possibly offer for why the subject of the search warrant would not be allowed to know? Oh no, I'm so glad you interrupted me with that, because both Jack Smith and Beryl Howell, who has been the chief judge, Donald Trump's chief antagonist, by the way, on the most powerful federal court in the country, aside from the Supreme Court, what they both argued is that if Trump found out about the search warrant, he could possibly flee the country. He would cause violence in the streets. He would intimidate witnesses. So this was the application that Jack Smith gave Beryl Howell, and that is the justification and rationale she used in signing off on this non-disclosure order. And that is what Twitter tried to appeal. They wanted, under their First Amendment rights, to fight the non-disclosure order, saying that they had a right to tell their user, Donald Trump, about this. And that's what both Judge Howell and Jack Smith and then the three-judge panel prevented uh, them from doing. And this was the appeal that was eventually upheld. Was this the Elon Musk era of Twitter throughout? So very interesting. Jack Smith, because he's a dirtbag, um, took advantage of the transition period. So this was January of 2023, as Elon Musk was buying Twitter. And get this, Vince, this is how either ham-handed or dirty they are. They sent this unprecedented search warrant, nothing like this has ever been done before, as these four appellate judges said in this letter. They sent the search warrant to a non-working website portal on Twitter's internet page where it sat for days with no attorney seeing it and Twitter's attorneys didn't even know about it until Jack Smith's prosecutors called finally reached them and said oh by the way you have the search warrant pending and by the way you have two days to comply and that was just part of this drama here so they set an untenable deadline didn't handle it the right way probably intentionally forced them to produce these records. And I mean, this is a massive trove. This isn't just Trump. This is people, millions of accounts who interacted with Trump's account, C accounts that he liked or followed or other users who liked or followed or blocked or unblocked his account. I mean, this violated the privacy rights of millions of Americans. But Judge Howell, these three Democrats on the appellate court, and certainly Jack Smith didn't care. So... But these four judges who did write this, Vince, to your point, it was really a breath of fresh air to finally call them out on violating the Constitution, on violating congressional balance of powers requirements and case law that demands a former president is entitled to assert executive privilege in any circumstance when anyone is seeking his record. Right. They should presume right away that anything that's not already public is entitled to executive privilege protections because, you know, the, the whole idea is that we afford a degree of secrecy to the president's deliberations in order to allow him to have the most space possible to make wise decisions. And um, that is not what they did here. The court just acted as if everybody was entitled to this to this information except for Trump himself. And it's interesting that you uh, point out that they used some sort of random comment form to serve the subpoena to Twitter, uh, which is which is insane to me. And of course, they knew what they were doing. They didn't really want to talk to a human. They wanted to, uh, you know, get it in front of it so they can make the case in front in front of the court and uh, and demand these documents and say that Twitter was out of compliance that they failed to give give it to them. But and furthermore, you know, Ben Jack Smith asked Judge Howell to hold Twitter in contempt of court. For not meeting this deadline, it's, that they messed up in the first place, so she fined them three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for allegedly failing to comply and missing the deadline for two days. Never it, mind that Jack Smith messed it up in the first place. Yes, that's right. And this is, of course, they're they're imposing a fine on another political opponent of Joe Biden, which is Elon Musk, three hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, the, the crazy thing to me, one of the many crazy things here, Julie Kelly, is the feds have no problem getting a hold of Twitter when they want to censor the American people. They've got contacts for that. They literally have conversations about what content to censor. But the second they want to send a subpoena over, they use an online comment form. Is that what happened? Yeah. Where's Elvis Chan when we need him on the San Francisco <laughs> FBI field office? You know, he's got all the Twitter people on uh, on hot dial. And this was before Elon Musk really took over. Right. But Beryl Howell, she really needs to be removed from the bench. She is a danger. She is a cancer 
to this country, the things that she has done, not just to go after Trump, his associates, Repu- Republican members of Congress. She also forced uh, Scott Perry to turn over his um, files, his data off of his cell phone to the government, saying that there was evidence of a crime on there related to January 6th. I mean, this is how dangerous this woman is. So to hear her colleagues in the same courthouse upend her uh, in, in a pretty stark way. I mean, they did not mince words about uh, what she did here, the unprecedented nature and the danger for the future, which she wrote, Naomi Rouse said, this is not for an incumbent president. Then now these new rules apply to a sitting president. So you could have a special counsel ask a third party, a cell phone provider, social media company. We want all of the president's records. And by the way, don't disclose that to him. And right now you have the case law precedent to justify that. It's completely out of control. So so where does this go from here? My, these four judges were in the minority, right, yesterday? They were. So what happened after the three-judge panel, then the next step is to ask what's called an en banc um, full review, the entire court, 11 or 12 judges, to look at what the three-judge panel did. Well, the entire court denied it. The problem is that Trump did not get involved. He did not assert executive privilege protections. It was too late anyway, because Vince, Twitter was forced to turn over these records in March of 2023, and they already signed off on the non-disclosure. And Twitter really didn't have standing to assert executive privilege for Donald Trump. So unfortunately, the issue by and large is moot. But I'm assuming that Twitter will still seek um, cert, a petition before the Supreme Court to review now what the lower court, the circuit court did, and use this 12-page statement from Republicans as cannon fodder to ex- to, to demonstrate how unprecedented, how wrong, how yes. unlawful their acts were. Well, how filthy this whole thing is. Trump couldn't claim an so executive pr- privilege protection because he wasn't even aware that his data was being sought. And um, what the judges pointed out is that Jack Smith could have gone to the National Archives. They also have a copy of all of Trump's data, Twitter data, which right there demonstrates that those were official presidential records. He didn't go to the National Archives because it would have triggered an automatic notice to Donald Trump that the government is seeking your records. So Jack Smith, as again, these judges pointed out, did this end around. So Donald Trump specifically would not be notified by the National Archives that Jack Smith was looking for his Twitter data. So so the American people elected Donald Trump to be president of the United States, and along with that comes the power and privileges and benefits of being president of the United States. One of those is the notification you just described. Jack Smith, by trying to circumvent that, was quite clearly trying to undermine the will of the American people, wasn't he? He absolutely was, and that's what the judges pointed out. And that's why they consistently said this is unprecedented. It is unlawful. Um, You know, they didn't say the word sneaky, but they said you obscured the normal process. And then went back to the judges who ultimately are are responsible. And what they all wrote about their colleagues, again, is that any presidential material should be presumed presidential material and subject to an assertion of executive privilege. They were all in cahoots, all Democrats, Jack Smith. Four Democrat judges, three Dems on the panel. And and keep in mind, this is important. The judge who authored the three panel ruling upholding Judge Howell was Florence Pant, the idiot who last week in the oral arguments on the immunity issue brought up the SEAL Team 6 assassination hypothetical. These are the people making the serious decisions in our country, not just for now, but for permanently for the future. And these are the reckless partisans who have that power in their hands, and this is how they use it. It's just disgraceful. I want to ask you about one other uh, Trump legal proceeding today. There's this uh, civil trial going on in Manhattan with E. Jean Carroll. Have you been following the details here today, Julie? Just a little bit, yes. It's it's just wild. The, 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 that whole case— so people are reminded, you know, E. Jean Carroll's a columnist. She accused Trump of rape. A jury found that they couldn't find any evidence that Trump had raped her. There was no liability for Trump on that. Uh, the media has misreported the jury's findings ever since on that subject. Uh, and now and now there's a defamation case going on because because Trump insists that he's innocent. He d- didn't even know her, didn't rape her or anything like that. E. Jean Carroll has sued him again 
for defamation for basically accusing her of being a liar. Now it plays out in the court. Today, the judge, uh, who is grumpy that Trump is even there, is upset that Trump has been um, kind of basically s- s- mouthing the words or saying loud enough that the jury could hear it that this is a witch hunt, this is a con job, uh, and has <laughs> and has threatened to kick Trump out of the trial. Trump responded, I would love it, he said. Uh, and the judge said, I understand you're probably very eager for me to do that because you just can't control yourself. So tr- Donald Trump practically daring this judge to boot him from the trial today. Uh, Trump's in the fight, and he's... He's going to he's going to hearings he doesn't even need to be at, Julie Kelly. I think the American people are waking up to just like every other institution in our country. We have a serious crisis in our judiciary. These judges are not responsible. They don't even hide their partisanship. Um, They are mini tyrants from the bench. And of course, we've had this problem uh, for a long time. But now it's completely out of control. And you and I have talked about this, about the judges just overseeing the January 6th prosecution, the same issue. Um, But without enough oversight from the higher courts, including the Supreme Court or congressional oversight, we are going to continue this descent into where these really, in many cases, stupid judges are making such important decisions. And today, I think it's Judge Kaplan is, is his name. Yeah. Uh, it's just the latest latest representation of that. Yeah. And, and they're handling a case that's being funded by a Democrat mega donor. This lawsuit is being funded by Reed Hoffman, the uh, co-founder of LinkedIn, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, if you're looking for, uh, you know, the connective tissue here, it's all Democrats looking to destroy Donald Trump and anybody who would dare vote for him. That's right. And by extension now, we see it playing out in D.C. and other places, his supporters, his aides, family members, and his voters. Yep. There's no end to how they will abuse their power to destroy the right. Which is why they shouldn't have that power. Julie Kelly, thank you very much. Always appreciate your reporting and your insight. Good to talk to you today. Okay, I've got some updates for you out of Manhattan. This E. Jean Carroll trial, uh, they've uh, concluded today's events. They'll pick up again tomorrow morning. Uh, Donald Trump getting scolded by the judge today. Hey, you better keep your mouth shut or I'm going to kick you out of this trial. He dared her. He, he's like, go for it. Him, Judge Kaplan, him uh, today. He's like, go for it. I dare you. <laughs> Remove me. Uh, so far, that has not happened. Alina Haba, you've seen her. She represents Donald Trump uh, as an attorney and as a spokeswoman on television for him from time to time. Uh, and she was questioning E. Jean Carroll today. Remember, th- this is a defamation case. Part of E. Jean Carroll's claims are, because Trump talked about her and denied the accusations against him, that she received death threats. She said, I was receiving death threats. So that's the basis for her defamation suit. She deleted the death threats. Alina Haba, this is the court transcript today. This has been this is not directly from the court, but shared by Inner City Press that's uh, reporting on this. Alina Haba, so you have the death threats. Carol, I deleted them. Haba, so you, Carol's lawyer, asked and answered. Haba, this is a very important question. Carol's lawyer, I object to the commentary, too. Carol, I, I may have deleted some emails, too. I'm, I'm not sure. Haba, did you give them to your lawyers? Carol, no. Haba, why not? Carol, I don't want to upset them. Haba, Miss Carol, are you aware it's illegal to delete evidence? Carol's lawyer, objection. Haba, I move for a mistrial. Evidence has been deleted. Judge Kaplan, denied, and the jury will disregard everything Miss Haba just said. Says the judge. <laughs> so, so Trump's attorneys, Alina Haba, representing him here in this case today, says, wait a second, you said you got death threats. Where's the evidence for it? Did you provide it to your attorneys? No, I deleted all of the evidence. <laughs> you realize deleting evidence is a crime. Objection. The judge jumping in obviously hates Trump. Strike all of that. Don't let the jury hear it. Jury, please disregard. It's all a scam. It's all one gigantic scam. Coming up on the program, Carrie Severino is going to talk to us. The government is out of control. The feds think they can do things Congress hasn't given them permission to do. A big case before the Supreme Court today on that subject. Carrie Severino will explain. 